podcast. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and most importantly, thanks for telling a friend. We recently got up on iTunes, so I've been able to track downloads and, uh, and everything with each episode, and we've been growing exponentially with each one. So that means the word's getting out there. Thank you to everybody for helping out. Uh, and again, thanks for supporting the show. I can see all the different things that people are doing, um, clicking through the Audible banner and getting themselves a free Audible or a, a $7.49 Audible membership. Uh, a lot of people are actually getting Love Me When I'm Gone, the book that I wrote and the audio book that I narrated and Mike Dawson uh, did the audio engineering for. That's a, a big help. Uh, a lot of people are going through and getting themselves some Onyx code. Again, use that checkout code RPL. We'll get you 10% off of your order. And if you don't like it, again, you can just tell them you didn't like it. You'll get your money back and you keep keep the stuff. So there's really nothing to lose with that. Uh, I've been taking the stuff for a lot longer than they've been a sponsor. And um, I love their stuff. I can't say enough good things about it. I actually had a few people contact me over the last few weeks asking if I really liked this stuff or if I was just trying to sell them as a sponsor. No, I was actually taking uh, Alpha Brain for quite a long time before we even started the podcast. Uh, so it really is. It's something I love. I believe in. I support 100%. And again, uh, Onnit supports it so much that if you're not completely satisfied, tell them and they'll give you your money back. So really nothing to lose. Use that checkout code RPL. Get yourself 10% off. Uh, also, if you're going to go check, uh, go buy anything on Amazon, doesn't cost you an extra penny, but click through the links on farfromcenter.com. Uh, do your shopping and it'll send us a little bit of love. So what does that mean? Uh, well, right now, we got with this company that, that uploads everything to iTunes for us, but you've got to pay for different amounts of bandwidth. So, you know, at first we were only doing one episode a week, but we started getting a lot of a following. So we upped it. Now we're doing two a week. Um, but to make that jump from two a week to three to five a week, uh, it's quite a, a, a difference. So when you when you do something like that, when you click through the links and support the show, that's what that money is going towards, is towards buying more bandwidth you know, doing stuff for the website, uh, buying equipment, doing other things that we would like to do to help kind of bring this show to the next level. So if you like what you hear, uh, you want to hear more of it, you want to keep hearing it. Um, we really appreciate you telling a friend and clicking on those support the show links through uh, farfromcentered.com. So there's something I really want to talk about this morning, and it's kind of a running theme uh, through this show. But it seems that people are interested, so uh, we'll keep going with it. And it's politics and politicians. And the thing that really gets me these days is people voting along party lines. Not along party lines, but just doing party line voting. What I mean by that is somebody that isn't even really paying attention to the issues or, or who the candidate is. They just know they're going to vote Republican or Democrat or whatever it is based on the party and not on the person. Now, why is this such a big issue for me? Well, whenever you get any kind of a large organization, and the RNC and the DNC are huge organizations, you're going to get bad apples in there. Now, me, I very much do not support the two-party system. Uh, one of the things that really bothered me was I was listening to the Dennis Prager radio show last week, and I heard Ann Coulter on, uh, and she was saying that libertarians, you know, they're nothing but hippies and college students. And uh, no real serious people would vote for Libertarian, and uh, Ron Paul was just an anomaly, and and doing all these things to kind of try and like badmouth and misdirect people from the Libertarian Party. Now, I'm a former Green Beret. Uh, I've been, you know, to every war that we're involved in. Um, most of my friends are Green Berets, and you know what, Ann Coulter? Uh, more of my friends voted for Ron Paul than Mitt Romney. So you can suck it. Uh, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, and that's one of the biggest issues. Uh, I watched that that movie about the Sarah Palin, John McCain uh, presidential run. I can't remember the name of it. Um, Game Change or, or whatever it was. And that was one of the most poignant parts of that movie, I felt, was at the end of it when the guy that played John McCain went to the, the woman who played uh, Sarah Palin and said, don't let people like Limbaugh uh, take over the party because they'll destroy it. And that is what's going on right now. If you pay attention to politics... Um, they're getting as extreme left and right as they can. Uh, there is no more bipartisanship. There are no more conservative Democrats, it seems, and there are no more liberal-leaning conservatives. There's no more center. Um, I don't know why that is, because it seems that America is going center because we understand that this fractional politi political system is destroying our country. 
but politicians are going way away from that. And the thing that kills me about this is that we're no longer getting the real message from politicians. Uh, they're going extreme left or extreme right to say whatever they need to say to get votes. And the thing this, that scares me about this is it's all about the money in politics. Uh, people used to go and run for politics or run for political office because they really wanted to do something to help the country. And they would do their time, and then they would leave office and go back to running their business or being a pillar of the community or doing whatever it is that they did. That doesn't happen anymore. A politician is a job now. And so they, it is, they're, they're going to lose their job. That, that's the thing. They, they feel that if they don't get the votes and they don't get it, they're going to lose their job. And that's their only thing they have to do. You know, you get these people that have gone to college to be politicians. They've spent their entire life in politics. And that's really all they have. It's just like you, if you have a computer science degree and you lose your job working for Apple, the only thing you can do is work for a computer company. You know, they have nothing else to do. They have to be in politics until they get done and they go be a consultant for another political company. But but that's it. And so <clears throat> that's their real push to stay in. And it really is hurting the country. And another thing about the money in politics that's really, really getting me worked up. Uh, I have a friend that's a political science professor at a college here in Los Angeles who's going to come on the show and talk specifically about money in politics. But... For me specifically, uh, my wife is an actress. I'm an author. I have a marketing degree. So I have a lot of background in like marketing and imaging and PR and all this stuff like that. And the thing that is killing me is that these days you don't see it on the debates. Those are, you know, very well orchestrated events. But each of these candidates, doesn't matter which party they're for or which level of, of, um, of election it is, but there are teams and hordes of marketing and PR and imaging people standing behind the curtains, telling them what to say at each commercial break, telling them what their message needs to be to capture this demographic. So you no longer have a politician telling you his mind or his real ideas or his real views on these issues. It's what his team is telling him he or she should be saying to capture a certain demographic. And Mitt Romney was at least honest with it. His Etch-A-Sketch uh, comment that he made that really did kill him, uh, it was the truth. And that's what they're all doing these days. You know, every single politician, it's just, you know, Doug Benson had a great thing that he said. Uh, he was saying that, you know, the left and the right, Democrats and Republicans, they both try to make you feel like they care about you. They're both lying, but, it, you know, the Democrats are are better at it. They're better at making you think they care about you, but they don't. At least Mitt Romney was honest. That's what politics are today. It's just saying whatever your team says needs to be said at whatever point to get whatever votes and make it one step further in the process. Uh, and that terrifies me. And that's when people vote party lines and don't actually look at a person. Uh, that's what they're they're promulgating that they're allowing that they're they're incentivizing that kind of behavior. And it kills me. And no longer will an independent, you know, that's why the independents don't get much traction in this country because they actually follow their beliefs. They follow their morals. They they say what they went into politics to say. They're really trying to make a change and change the way the system is working. Uh, but they get outed by these other politicians that just say whatever they need to say to get your vote. So look at their background. Do a little bit of study. Don't just swallow what Fox and CNN and MSNBC are telling you. Don't just listen to what these politicians say at their debates. Do some research. Find some real background into them and for, learn for yourself. Um, I, I like to say there's an excuse for stupid, but there's no excuse for ignorant. Uh, some people are just born stupid. That's the way they are. Some people are born the children of you know concert pianists and physicists. We don't all have those cards. Um, but it is your choice whether you're ignorant of the world around you or not. Uh, so one of the things that I really wanted to get into with this topic is conservatism and the definition of conservatism. Uh, I was you know, I was born in Florida, raised in Texas, uh, spent eight years in the Army. Uh, it's you know pretty safe to say that I'm pretty conservative. You can hear my views on, on most of these shows. Uh, I was a card-carrying Republican for a very long time, and I've gone away from that in recent years because I've taken on some liberal ideologies. I've taken on some libertarian ideologies. And the thing that gets me about Republicans these days is Republicans call themselves conservatives, but they've gone away from the true message of conservatism. 
and that is small, limited government. Um, basically, for one, the government should be able to tax everything that you do because the government has proven to be wildly inefficient. Uh, if you want more on my views about that, uh, you can listen to episode 001. It's not on iTunes yet. Again, we don't have the bandwidth for me to put everything up yet, but it is on the farfromcenter.com website. Uh, I think it's on lemmywhenimgone.com too. Um, but that's basically me ranting for an hour about sequestration and how the government has this culture of spending. Spending. I also was on the Jiggy Jaguar uh, radio, internet radio program. You can search that. I, I did a interview last week about sequestration and the government's culture of spending. So you can also listen to that. Uh, but that's one of the main things is that, you know, the more we give them in taxes, the more they're going to grow and they will never fix their inefficiencies. And that's a problem with increasing our budget every year and raising taxes rather than cutting spending because there really is, you know, the DOD, whenever, whenever anyone says we should cut the defense budget, people get up in arms and pretend like that means we're going to be taking bullets and body armor away from soldiers No, we waste billions upon billions of dollars on stupid, stupid, redundant things all the time. And people don't really know about it because most of our politicians aren't veterans these days. Um, But one of my other big things about conservatives, conservativism, uh, is that whole idea of limited government and that the government shouldn't be allowed to tell you how to live your life. That's not their job and it's not their scope, but it's what they're trying to do lately. Um, but with conservatives, it's that that's one of their biggest edicts is that the government shouldn't tell you how to live your life. But lately, it's become the government shouldn't be able to tell you how to live your life unless you do something we don't agree with. And it's a huge state of hypocrisy. Now, on the one hand, I do believe that we need more God in our culture. Uh, but for me, I don't care what you call him. I don't care if you call him God or Jehovah or Allah or Yod, or whatever your name for him is. I believe having religion in your background does help you to live your life as a better person. I believe uh, teaching your kids that you will have to answer to someone for your life at the end of your life um, does help lead them to be better moral and upstanding and good individuals. But the place that it really gets me is when you try to use it to shame people or harm people or tell people how to live their life. Uh, and so a big place this is really getting me lately is gay rights and gay marriage. Um, so conservatives on the one hand say the government shouldn't be able to tell you how to live your life. But on the other hand, they're saying, if you're gay, uh, we're not going to allow you to get married. We, sh- we don't believe you should have equal rights. And I don't understand how that ties in with the true message of conservatism. I believe that's not a conservative ideology. I believe conservatives follow should follow that that idea that the government has no place telling you about that. And, you know, the place that I sit with gay rights is, you know, number one, it in no way affects me. It doesn't affect me at all. Uh, So I don't understand why people who it does not affect are so vigilant about trying to bar them from any kind of rights, you know? And and here's my thing. I have have several friends who have come out in the last few years as being gay, and they've come out to all of their friends— or all of our friends, except for me, because they were afraid that I was going to basically shun them for that. Um, number one, I have a pretty good gaydar. Uh, and so most of my friends that have come out and, you know, I hear it through the grapevine, I kind of go, yeah, dude, I knew that the, the second I knew them. Because for me, I judge people on their character. Uh, character has nothing to do with your race, color, creed, or sexual orientation. A good person is a good person, whether they're black, white, you know, yellow, red, whatever color you are, if you're Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're Arabic, if you're Muslim, anything. And and if you're straight or gay, that has nothing to do with your moral character. I, I don't think that defines who you are as a person. I do, however, believe that most of the people that I know when they've come out as gay, it changes their life profoundly because they have this huge secret that they've been carrying over their head or carrying on their shoulders for a very long time. And, and once they come out and realize that, you know, the people that I'm friends with are, are, are pretty good people. And, and I wouldn't be friends with somebody if they would judge somebody based on something like that. And so it really does, it relieves them that they're not harboring this secret anymore. And, and it really hurt me that they wouldn't want to come out to me, that they would think I would judge or shun them based on something like that. And, and I think our society 
I, I don't know why in the world we do because homosexuality has been around much longer um, than just us and our generation. It's been along, around much longer than our country. It's been around longer than the United States of America. It's been around longer than organized religion and Christianity, uh, for sure. And that's what kind of got me started on this, was I saw a Facebook uh, posting a friend of mine put up of somebody holding a banner that said, marriage was around before Christianity. It's not your time to define it. And I think that's that's true, and I think that's a great saying. I'd never seen it phrased like that before, but it really is great, uh, and it's truth. Uh, homosexuality was very big in the Greek culture. Uh, it was big in the Roman culture. It was big in the Middle East, the cradle of civil civilization, and it's still very big in the Middle East. Um, I don't know why we feel it's our time to define it right now in our culture. Uh, that's still a very new culture. Our country is a very new country. Our ideals are still very new. And, you know, if, if the United States of America was founded on the idea of individual liberties, who the hell are we to tell people how to live their life? That's exactly what we're infringing on is their individual liberties. Um, I don't see where it's our business to tell them how to live their life. You know, they're not doing it for monetary gain. Uh, you know, they, they take more stress onto their lives by coming out as gay. Um, and I think that's something that somebody wouldn't do haphazardly. I think they, they do that because they truly believe that's who they are and who the hell are we to tell them that they're not or they need to be some other way. You know what? Let people be happy. As Louis C.K. says, those people have parades for the way they have sex. Nobody's having a parade for the way I have sex. So who, how is it up to me to tell them that that's bad? So I don't know. That's just me. Conservatives, if you're, gonna, if you're truly going to be conservative and truly preach that you believe in liver, lim limited government, then practice what you preach. Don't tell people how to live their life. And you know what? Let's focus on things that are a little bit more consequential these days, like war, like the military industrial complex, like the absolute culture of spending we have in our government, like welfare getting out of control, social security getting out of control, our economy falling into shambles, and politicians who couldn't care less who are still doing nothing more but focusing on pork and politics and their own little slice of the pie and keeping their job rather than making this country a better place. Okay, so I'm going to get off my uh, soapbox now, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this episode. Uh, first, we're going to play Shattered Glass by Mike Amobile and Run Over Twice. Uh, we've got a famous Freemason uh, by Brother Robert, Robert Johnson. Today, we're doing Arnold Palmer. Uh, I've been invited to play in a charity golf tournament. It's the Carl's Jr. Golf Tournament in Industry Hills here in a few weeks. Uh, so I thought Arnold Palmer, that was a great... Uh, a great addition for this episode. Uh, we're going to be interviewing Clint Janulis. Clint is a good buddy of mine. He's a former Marine, uh, former Green Beret. That's where we met. Uh, we went through the Special Forces uh, medic course together. Uh, he's taught his own college classes. After he got in the Army, he uh, went and got his undergrad in archaeology, and he's been teaching some classes at Colorado uh, University of Colorado or Colorado State. Part owner of Rogue Consulting. Uh, he's got an undergrad in archaeology, like I said, and he's been he's going to do his PhD study at Oxford later this year. He's also been given his own reality show. He's basically going to be the American Bear Grylls, and honestly, this man's a lot better looking than Bear Grylls. He's awesome. You should uh, check him out. So, again, we're going to go into the song first. Uh, this is Shattered Glass by Mike Amabile and Run Over Twice. If you uh, like Mike Amabile, you can check out one of our uh, former episodes. I think it was episode six where we interviewed him. Uh, but here we go. Have a listen. This is Shattered Glass by Mike Amabile and Run Over Twice. I can see you sitting over there In your big black fancy Lexus Yeah Not a worry, not a care like you're the queen of Texas Yeah And your precious eyes won't compromise To look in my direction You know I'm there, but you don't care but Like I got some infection Funny with all your jokes and your 
classy business suit. Yeah, for all your money and your hopes, you haven't got a clue. Yeah, but not too far across the bar. The clock is ticking fast. By now you know you'll be growing old at the bottom of a glass. I don't know. Change my point of view and walk a different line. Your time will come. What's done is done. Your future waits for you. It's coming fast like shattered glass. There's nothing. If you like that track, uh, click through the support the show links on farfromcenter.com, pick up that track on Amazon, or pick up the whole album. That's off the Open Your Eyes album. Also, you can go back and listen to episode six and uh, and our interview with Mike Amobile. It's actually, so far it's downloads. It's got about three times the amount of downloads as any other show, so you guys must really like him. I know I do. Um, okay, so now we're going to listen to uh, Brother Robert Johnson with our weekly famous Freemason. Again, this is... Arnold Palmer, uh, the famous golfer. I hope I can uh, channel and take a little strength from him uh, when I'm playing in a few weeks so I don't make a fool out of myself. So here we go. Brother Robert Johnson, take it away. Hey, everyone. Brother Robert Johnson here from the podcast Whence Came You and managing editor of the Midnight Freemasons website, bringing you this week's famous Freemason. This professional golfer is generally regarded as one of the greatest players in the history of men's professional golf. Brother Arnold Palmer has won numerous events on both the PGA Tour and Champions Tour dating back to 1955. He was nicknamed the King and is one of golf's most popular stars and its most important trailblazer because he was the first superstar of the sports television age, which began in the 1950s. He is part of the Big Three in golf, along with Jack Nicklaus and Gary Player, who are widely credited with popularizing and commercializing the sport around the world. Palmer won the PGA Tour Lifetime Achievement Award in 1998 and in 1974 was inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. Palmer was born in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. He learned golf from his dad, Milford, who actually had polio, but was a groundskeeper at a local club where he could hang out with his dad all the time. He attended Wake Forest University on a golf scholarship. He left upon the death of a close friend, Bud Worsham, and enlisted in the United States Coast Guard, where he served for three years and had some time to continue to hone his golf skills. Palmer returned to college and competitive golf eventually. His win in the 1954 U.S. Amateur made him decide to try the Pro Tour for a while, and he and his new bride, Winifred Walzer, whom he had met at a Pennsylvania tournament, traveled the circuit in 1955. 
A couple of interesting things about Palmer is that he grew up with Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And in his career playing golf, he raked in, according to Golf Digest, $1,861,857 in the 734 PGA Tour career starts over 53 years. And if you think that's a lot, then consider the fact that he made 15 times that off the course in 2008 for advertising. He is a member of Loyal Hannah Lodge, number 275 in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Robert Johnson. Again, uh, if you like what you hear, you can follow the Whence Came You podcast on iTunes. You can support their show by downloading their app on Stitcher Smart Radio or their Android or iPhone app. Follow them at Whence Came You or go to the uh, Facebook page for the Whence Came You podcast. I love those guys. They also have the Midnight Freemasons blog. Uh, A lot of really good stuff. If you're interested in history, uh, religious history or Masonic history. Uh, those guys put out a lot of great knowledge. Again, that's the basic, uh, the basis of Freemasonry is we're students of ancient history. So we go a lot deeper than most textbooks would teach you. We like to go into the ancient history and, um, and those guys have a lot of great knowledge that they teach. Uh, okay. So now we're going to get right into it. This is our interview with, uh, Clint Janulis, good friend of mine, great dude, combat veteran, Marine and Green Beret, tough as nails, Best looking guy I've ever met in my life. And, uh, dude, he's going to Oxford to get his PhD. A, green, a special forces combat veteran is about to be going to Oxford to do his PhD and has his own reality show. Uh, I think he's probably the coolest guy that I know. Uh, after this interview, you'll probably think the same. So have a listen. Here we go with Clint Janulis. All right, so we're sitting down here with my brother from another mother, uh, my Green Beret buddy, Clint Janulis. Uh, I told you a little bit about Clint in the introduction, but uh, I got to tell you another thing. It's I know it's a podcast, can't really see him, but Clint's one of the few guys that I know that he's got brains, he's got balls, and he's got brawn, and he's one of the best goddamn looking men I've ever seen. Uh, Clint Janulis, how you doing? Thanks for sitting down with us on the uh, program tonight. Hey, Rob. Thanks for the fluff. So, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of different reasons that I want to have you on and talk to you. Uh, but, you know, we met in the military and you've got one of the richest military histories out of all the guys that I know. So would you mind introducing uh, yourself to the, the audience a little bit and tell them a little bit about your military history to begin with and we'll get into the rest of your history? Yeah, no worries. Um, well, I kind of did the normal fuck up route. Uh, I went to college when I was 18, promptly dropped out after... Um, a year of playing football and not going to class and joined (laughs) the Marine Corps and became a marksmanship instructor. So that's all right. Now that's a big deal Uh, for people that don't understand. uh, Everybody thinks that anybody, anybody in the military in the army, Navy, Marines or whatever, you know, Chris Dorner was a big thing here uh, last month or the month before the, you know, that guy went crazy and was shooting everyone. And people were making this big deal out of him being a sniper, like a special operations, you know, dead eye dick. But he was in reality just a, he was a Navy reservist that uh, was a sergeant of the guard or something. But a U.S. Uh, a military uh, a Marine military marksmanship instructor. Marines take that very seriously, and they actually have their uh, their BRM, so their rifle marksmanship. They they actually got to qualify what like a hundred meters further out than the Army does. Uh, like we we call it five hundred yards. Yeah, and the Army does it four hundred meters, right? I think something three hundred. Like 300. Yeah, I know it's a lot less. The Marines take that pretty seriously. So that's a that's a pretty big feather in your cap there. Yeah, I you know, uh that is one of those skills I will always be happy I learned through the Marine Corps. And while the Army has some programs that are really excellent at teaching marksmanship, the Marine Corps manages to teach every Marine how to shoot at 500 yards. And it, it's really damn impressive. Uh, and they do take their shooting quite seriously. And I, I think the Army could learn a lot by following the Marine Corps' example in that regard. Yeah, and more than one. The, um, the, the Army is definitely getting a, a little soft in my mind. Uh, you know, that was the big, the big joke when we were in the kinder, gentler Army. And uh, I think the, the, the worst shooting Army kind of goes along with that. And that's a big part of being in the military. So I think the Marines have it right on that one. Uh, so after the Marines, you actually, you went to the army, right? You took a step down and went over to the army. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I wouldn't call it that, but after nine 11, um, 
I had several Marine friends who were in force reconnaissance, mm-hmm. and they switched over to the Army to go special forces because that's where the budget was, that's where the training was, and that's where the missions were. And after uh, I was doing my process to get into the force rec- recon, every one of them was like, hey, bro, we're kind of bailing on this ship, man. Uh, we're going to the Army. And I went and joined the Army. I, look, I looked at the program, and the Marine, the Army program was – it's really robust. You get a lot of skills for what you're doing right. uh, compared to, say, Marine Recon, which they're excellent shooters, excellent tacticians. But the Army, you go in, you'll also learn another language. You learn uh, paramedic or you get paramedic certified. You know, you, you get a wider variety of skill sets out of the Army program. Yeah, that was you know one of my favorite sayings that I got out of the Q course. One of my instructors used to always love to say, that Green Berets are the jack of all trades and the master of none. And I think that's a great example of just kind of everything. You're expected to go into any situation and just figure it out. That's it. Like, that's what a Green Beret is. You just really have to be able to go anywhere and do anything at any time with uh, little to no preparation or backup or uh, or anything at all. Uh, and that was, it was a pretty common theme. I went through phase two with a couple guys from, uh, they were in Force Recon, and then... You and I both had a, a mutual friend in the medic course who uh, was a force recon guy. They all had that same story. It was the same thing. They they didn't have the budget. Force recon wasn't under SOCOM, so they weren't getting the missions. And um, so they all just left. They came over to SF. And we're, you know, we're stronger. For, SF was stronger for it. We, we got a lot of guys with a lot of uh, great skill sets that the, they brought over from the Marine Corps. And every one of those guys was notable, I recall, going through the Q course uh, because they were so proficient at what they did at the tactical aspect of what we were doing. Um, oh yeah, great experience too. Very knowledgeable, smart, and tough as nails guys. Yeah, and so you know, I don't. I I'm really quite happy I did go through the Marine Corps first. Um, but I would suggest anybody not doing that could probably get a somewhat similar experience going through maybe Ranger Battalion or something or Hard Charging Infantry Unit, Airborne Unit of yeah. some nature. Um. But, you know, I, I liked the, I loved the guys I worked with. Uh, but at the same time, the Army SF program was just hands down the 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 best thing going at the time. So. so you knew, like from the day that you went to the Army, you knew you were going to the Army to go into Special Forces and become a Green Beret, right? Yeah, it was the only reason I joined. Uh, it was my one goal. Uh, if, if I had not achieved that goal, I would have just gotten out. Um, but unfortunately, before I could try out, uh, we were called up, not called up, but we were deployed for the invasion of Iraq. So uh, when I joined the army, I was in an artillery unit and they showed up, uh, I think maybe January, they asked for every person on post that had a secret or above clearance, had been to infantry school and wanted to volunteer for a hazardous operation. <laughs> Did they, and, is that all they said was hazardous? <laughs> I think the word was hazardous. And at the time, <laughs> I was, I had had trouble getting into the Army Special Forces tryouts because I had had laser surgery on my eyes, and they weren't letting guys in at that time. Yeah, that was a big thing that I heard. Uh, uh, actually, my best friend Taylor and I had planned on going in together, and we had talked about it forever, uh, but he had PRK. And that was his big thing was he had read somewhere that if you went to – if you had PRK, you couldn't go to Halo or Scuba School or either – and I always thought that was just BS. I thought that was an old wives' tale, but that was true. Okay, a PRK was a little bit different surgery. I had LASIK. Oh, it was LASIK PR- that you couldn't have. Okay, La- PRK was uh, kind of the old school. It's a little more invasive. Yeah, it's and, where they actually use a scalpel, right? And LASIK is a laser. Yeah, and I'm not sure, you know, all the specifics, but the point was, any laser eye surgery disqualified you at that time. Now, the year before, it did not. And it turns out the year after did not just during that year, I guess it was the group uh, surgeon who declared that that was a disqualifying uh, surgery. So I was stuck in a job I hated in the army with, uh, you know, I came from the Marine Corps. And as you said, downgraded, I don't want to say that, but I was in a job I was miserable in uh, with people, some of whom... (laughs) What's the word? Uh, they weren't my people. Yeah. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I think that's funny because that's you know a common theme that I find uh, from every SF guy that I meet that was in you know big army or Marines or whatever for a long time is they just didn't fit in, you know, wherever they were. Like everybody talks about the thinking outside of the box or, you know, the lone wolf or, uh, or whatever it is that, that makes you that kind of special operations guy. But everybody that I met in SF, uh, whether it be an infantry guy or somebody that came from artillery, the Marines or anything, that was their thing. They were in a unit. They didn't fit into the, you know, they didn't conform to that unit. They knew they didn't fit in. They knew they were meant for something else. And yeah, it's just funny. Everybody shares that same kind of story. Yeah, I did. I did definitely did not fit in. Now there were several guys that uh, actually were really top notch dudes in that unit. I still communicate with them today, and I'm happy I served with them. Uh, but at the time, I just been told I couldn't go to the special forces tryouts. That's uh, when they showed up. Some uh, an organization showed up on our base asking for volunteers. I volunteered. I ended up on the weapons of mass destruction search team with the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, uh, a very small team in Iraq during the invasion. And it was uh, one of the most interesting guided tours I've ever had in my life. I mean, it so was, uh, who was it? Was it guided by not Iraqis, but was it guided like State Department or was it this other? What, what agency uh, was that? Okay, so there's. Um, there was a number of government organizations that were participating in this. And we, there was a small contingent of soldiers, maybe six of us, if I remember right. Uh, we were the security, the reaction force, you name it. Uh, and then there were another six to eight civilian types. So we, you know, there's a number of agencies, I guess. And it, when I say guided, what I mean was we didn't just ride with the convoys going through towns because we had to go search every little ammunition supply point where they might have been storing weapons of mass destruction. Uh So we rolled in with, say, the 101st. They'd be going to an objective or a target, and we'd cut off with four or five vehicles and go search five or six sites in a three- or four-day period just by ourselves. No support, no tactical capabilities, nothing. We were just... And these weren't special operations guys. This is just a, a group of you guys that had been in an artillery unit? <laughs> right. Um, somehow, because I had been through Marine Corps boot camp, I became the tactical expert, which is scary. Um, and yeah, so we, we there were there were a couple guys who undoubtedly had prior been some form of spec ops or whatever, uh, but at you know, we weren't we weren't outfitted to be a direct action team. We weren't outfitted to go take targets. We were outfitted with a bunch of chemical and radiation and biological detectors to go in in full Tyvek suits with rebreathers on and test areas for possible signatures of weapons of mass destruction. Was there any rhyme or reason? I mean, did it seem like somebody had a plan and knew kind of where you guys should be looking, or was it literally? We go into this town, we check every damn nook and cranny and just just try just play whack-a-mole and try and find it. Now that and that's where the guided part came in. Mm-hmm. We were directed from other organizations as to where we should be searching. Hmm. So we were given like, hey, you will go search this site today, you know. Right. And we did that. And you know, while we, obviously we didn't find anything, we did find a lot of what I considered to be very suspicious things. Yeah. Um but, you know, it was interesting because we saw a side of Iraq that maybe not a lot of other soldiers got to see. And, uh, you know, I, I had a good tour, as it were. At that time, the Iraqis loved us. Everybody we encountered was, I mean, we everybody we encountered was very enthusiastic about our presence. Uh, thank yous every day. People were bringing us goats and chickens and lambs as uh, thank you gifts, welcome gifts everywhere we went. And so, you know, all in all, it was a good tour. We we took fire a few times, but nothing major, nothing I would call a a gunfight. Mostly just, Hey, I hear bullets. Oh, (laughs) there's holes in our canopy. (laughs) Oh, that's neat. (laughs) Is that at the time we were in Humvees that had cloth walls and doors. Yeah. And, you know, so, which always seemed really silly to me. We're the most advanced army in the world, yet the fact that our vehicles have cloth doors puts us on the level 
of hunter gatherers essentially i mean somebody with a well placed spear throw could have killed me as i was driving a vehicle right so i mean it seems silly i've got a twelve thousand dollar navigation system in a hundred thousand dollar truck that doesn't have aluminum doors you know somebody with a fucking spear can take me out (laughs) and with all the time that we spent like in sf with all the time you spend out in africa that's it's a joke but it's actually a reality i was like (laughs) there's some zulu warriors down there man where are our priorities (laughs) you know i I, i'm a butu pygmy tribesman could throw a spear and kill me and take all of my half a million dollars worth of equipment because nobody bothered to put a door on my damn vehicle. Yeah. Priorities, uh, priorities, priorities. <laughs> priorities, you know. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, there wasn't a high threat level, for our unit at least, at that time. And I came back and went to selection right away and got into the Special Forces training course. And that's where I met you. Yeah, we actually met. I mean, the first time we met briefly, uh, because, you know, for those people that don't understand, like the, the pipeline... You went to selection, then you went to airborne school. I went to SOPSI and then airborne school and then selection. And in airborne school, you sit on these benches for, what, like six hours at a time in your chute, completely rigged up. Can't pee, can't eat, can't smoke, can't walk, can't talk, can't do anything except sit there and sleep. And we were right across from each other. And I remember, I just remember looking at you and you had a certain look, you know, different, I don't know, people in the army have a different kind of step, you know, a different, a different look about them. And I just kind of knew that something was a little different about you. And, you know, it didn't take very long to find out you had just got back from selection. And so I just went, let me ask this guy everything in the world. And so that's kind of, that was our first meeting. And then we ended up in the Delta course together. I think it was our next meeting. And then we had French, we went through French, the French course together. That's right. Yeah. Oh. And so then at the end of the Q course, I went off to Germany and you went to Colorado. And yep. so where did, uh, where'd you go with that? Where'd you go with uh, 10th group? Uh, well, I did two more tours uh, in Iraq after that. I, I was uh, My team was one of the, what you might call the catcher's mitt in the surge as they pushed the insurgents up through the Diyala River Valley uh, from Baghdad and Bakuba. And that was, a, that, was a, that was a very special forces type trip. I mean, it was almost every sort of crazy thing you could have seen in a, a combat tour and uh you know it was ugly in terms of what happened you know the middle of the surge was just kind of a nightmare mm-hmm. uh and you know i when we went into it i was hesitant i wasn't i wasn't on board with the surge concept and you know that was that was mccain's deal he was pushing and you know i i give him a lot of props uh, kind of for having the courage to see that through because it worked and we were an integral part of that. And I, you know, that was, a an amazing tour. It was scary as shit. Uh, but it was amazing at the same time. And, you know, it was one of those tours where you can look back and say, I know we did good. We had a, a good team. The guys were all really competent. They were humane guys. You know, they weren't the sorts just out shooting indiscriminately or whatever. Uh, and that was a good tour. And then my next tour was a little more laid back. I was in Baghdad doing less exciting things, put it that way. And yeah, and I think uh, that one we were in Iraq, we were in Iraq together because we ran into each other in Baghdad at a chow hall. Actually, is that- yeah, yeah, because I had done, I went to Germany and then I did Afghanistan and Africa and Iraq. And then I moved back to Colorado and went with 3rd Battalion back to Iraq. And you were one of the, I think you were the first familiar face I saw. You're uh, right. Yeah, walking that, through the chow hall to get, get something to eat. Dude, I saw so many classmates in the chow hall that too were just yeah. out of the blue. And it was so out of context to see a guy you haven't seen in three years. <laughs> with a beard or without a beard. With a beard just, yeah. in the chow hall. And you're like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing, man? Yeah, I mean, it was – and those little moments are, uh, you know, in the context of what you're doing and where you're out, they're kind of powerful because, you know. Uh, it brings you back to center when you're in the middle of all that, like, chaos and craziness and just – terror one minute and boredom the next minute and then all of a sudden you see a guy you haven't seen in five years and it just gives you a, a, a moment of levity you know it does else. yeah 
Yeah. Absolutely. And that, that tour was uh, less terror and more boredom. But <laughs> yeah. uh, it was getting to the end when we were winding down. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, uh, th- so that I-, I learned a lot in that tour. It just wasn't as fun as it could have been, um, which is fine. Right. My wife, my wife appreciates that because my idea of fun <laughs> and hers are not the same thing. Obviously. <laughs> Cindy so, would agree. Yeah. Cindy actually, my, you know, Cindy, my wife and Amanda, your wife are actually pretty good friends and they're on, they're on the level. I mean, they, they, I think they're both, uh, see things the same way in that, in that respect yeah. at least. <laughs> they get that what we consider fun or life, uh, building experiences are not quite what they want us doing yeah so. she cindy's not as turned on by me not showering for six months and having a you know four inch beard as i am you know for me let me roll around in mud all day grow a beard and not shower and i'm as happy as a pig in shit literally she won't touch me with a 10 foot stick <laughs> well i don't blame her i guess yeah. you know if my if if my wife uh did that same thing i probably would suggest a shower <laughs> <laughs> send her to france <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, maybe a bit of water, yeah. hot, some soap, go for it. So, so after that, after OIF six, your life took a a pretty big turn. I mean, not just getting out of the army. Well, you, you got out of the army, but you went in the National Guard. But you came upon a, a specific course that has kind of shaped the rest of your life so far, right? Uh, you're you're right. I got out. I went into a National Guard unit. I was the senior medic on a uh, on an A team, a, a high altitude parachute team. And an opportunity came to attend the survival school instructor course, uh, ran by John, quotation marks, Prairie Wolf McPherson in eastern Kansas. And this is the course that they send all the wilderness survival instructors to uh, from the SEER course. And that's a a big distinction that I think we need to make for the listeners. Uh, Everybody hears special forces or special operations and automatically assumes that every one of us is like, a complete expert in survival that you can drop any one of us out in the middle of nowhere with nothing and we'll survive for years on end and that we're all, you know, expert marksmen, all this other stuff. We're great shots. We can hack it a lot more than most people in a lot of situations, but that term survival expert is something that shouldn't be given away that uh, loosely. And so the fact you had, you actually are trained as a survival expert and, not only an expert on your own, but to teach other people to be survival experts. And that's a, a big thing that I want uh, the audience to understand is that, you know, I'm a Green Beret and, you know, I, I would love to tell you that I'm the baddest, I'm the baddest motherfucker I ever lived, but I'm not. Uh, and that's a, a big distinction that, that, that's a, 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 a big hallmark that you did, a, a class you have that, that 98% of even special operations, which is less than 1% of the military hasn't had. So that's a, that's a pretty big feather in your cap right there. Yeah. And I was very fortunate to be able to attend that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, basically a course in how to be a caveman, but the, the instructor, John McPherson, his philosophy is in order to teach others, in order to be a true expert at this field, you will learn as if you have nothing modern and that includes anything metal so uh your flint and steel set throw that out the window that's modern uh high carbon steel you know requires a forge and requires smelting and all that other stuff so he teaches from a base as if you are dropped into the woods naked and that's actually what his uh book and his program is called is naked into the wilderness he teaches you how to survive from the ground level up and the course is really impressive because he spent 30 years narrowing it down uh, to the essentials. And this guy is like – he should have his own TV show if you want my opinion. He's just a, a character. He's got a – he's a big bearded hippie. He's not big, but he's a bearded like ex-Vietnam vet hippie with a ponytail and at any point in time probably has 10 guns on him, you know, so he's not a true hippie. He's, yeah. yeah. A little bit off. <laughs> he's a Midwest yeah. hippie. We'll put it Midwest that hippie. Yeah. I mean, guys, <laughs> you know, uh, as much a mountain man as it can be, you know, Jeremiah and, and, Johnson and Jerry Garcia rolled up into the same, uh, that's the kind same of a joint. good point. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, the school was really incredible. And I took that, um, cause when I got out, I started attending, college uh for a pre-medical and an anthropology degree 
And I, I took that, you know, one of my first semesters in school. And that course has influenced both my military career and my educa- educational career since that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it's I'm just knowing you, knowing the thread that you've taken, it's, it's you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty, but to look back at that class and the way that it's helped, and, you know, we'll get into that in, in a little bit. I don't want to spoil uh, everything right now, but it's it's amazing the way the cards fall sometimes, right? It uh, is. It, it really is amazing how it works out. And, you know, what's kind of funny, I just um, resolved this issue, but I took that course in the middle of a fall semester. So I had to convince all of my professors to allow me to take off class for a month. And I managed to get every one of them on board except for my algebra professor. So, you know, I took off for a month in the middle of school, which is not normally something uh, one does without withdrawing. Um, And I came back and I missed a few tests in the algebra course. I was hoping he was going to give me a buy, as it were, you know, a pass to let me retake them because I was technically on military orders. And he said no. So I ended up getting an F. So I failed my algebra course. Uh, The professor did not give me any leeway, and I I thought I could get uh, kind of a pass because I was on military orders for the the National Guard, Uh, but they were volunteer orders, and he said no. So I took an F in Hmm. in the algebra course. Uh, And at the time, I was obviously troubled by it because I had a 4.0 and uh, you know it turns out uh, missing class and getting that F was completely worth it to be able to attend that survival course right and so where which what school was it that you went to for your undergrad uh, I went to the, attended the University of Colorado Colorado Springs and then and now I remember because after you left the army, you went to school and then you had a couple of really big, pretty cool things. You got on and you started your own course. Was it at UCCS that you were teaching your own course? Yes. I uh, started two courses there, actually. One, a first aid and self-defense course for active shooting events called the FAST course. And that one is actually currently offered by the university as a credited um, continuing education credit course and that's targeted mostly to educators uh, people that work in offices for government organizations things like that and the school center for homeland security picked up the course and they offer it as part of their package Um, so it's you know it's like a three or four hour course that teaches the very basics of trauma skills you need to survive a shooting event that you know, the traditional Red Cross American Heart Association courses don't focus on enough. So it's tourniquets and pressure dressings and things of that nature. And then the other course was uh, I was asked to run a three-credit wilderness survival course for the university, which I ended up uh, doing this fall, and they're, they're keeping it on. Uh, I trained up a few other instructors to carry on with the program after I leave. And now there's another company that I, I feel I should mi- mention here. You're part owner of a company, Rogue Consulting, and it, it they do the, basically the same things. You go into schools and teach uh, all the staff how to basically react to these shooting exercises. And then you take – this is a really cool thing. I really wanted to get uh, the company that I work for to do it, uh, but they, they just – they're not of that mind frame. But – well, maybe I should let you explain it. Your your team building exercise that you do. You do some really cool things with that company. Can you briefly explain that a little bit? What Rogue Consulting is and what you guys do? Sure. Um, I linked up with a, another Green Beret medic, a Navy SEAL, and a British SAS medic as well. And we formed a company that focuses on team building and leadership development using special operations skill sets as the teaching platform. And one of the things we added was the first aid survival training, FAST. And in addition to that, we also offer a number of team building events that are geared more towards larger companies with a lot of middle management that they're trying to either do bonding events or team building events. And then we also linked up with an organizational psychologist from Columbia who helps us 
package it into sort of the corporate friendly jargon that they're used to. And that that's a project we've had on the side. Um, you know, if, if I had to say I have a job, that is my other job doing that. And that's rogue consulting group.com, which is technically separate from the fast club, but we integrated them. Um, so the university offers it and we are the sole vendor for the program. And you guys have a Facebook page as well, right? We do. It's a rogue consulting group on Facebook as well as a website, rogue consulting group.com. And <clears throat> right now we're in the process of turning over the skill sets, uh, to the other shareholder or to the other owners of the company, uh, as I'm leaving at the end of summer. So I will basically be a technical advisor after this summer. And we'll put, uh, for all the listeners, we'll put those links on farfromcenter.com. I know if you're listening to this on iTunes, you won't have the links. You can go to farfromcenter.com. They'll be on the uh, podcast episode for this. This will be episode eight. Uh, or you can also go to lovemewhenimgone.com. And under my friends links page, I have both their website and the Rogue Consulting Facebook page. Go over and like them and uh, see what they do because... It's very, very prevalent right now with all the things that are going on with Columbine and Newton and, and all the other school shootings that have been happening. Like you guys teach some pretty, pretty good knowledge that I, I want, you know, when Robert gets old enough, like he's going to learn this. If you guys are, are doing it, I, I want him to come learn it. The stuff we teach is, uh, was derived from what we learned in Iraq mm -hmm. when we would be working with a lot of indigenous people and we had a limited amount of time to teach them the skills that were necessary to keep them alive in case of a large mass casualty incident. So, you know, say I had 20 Iraqis in my guerrilla force and I had an afternoon to teach them just the minimum. These are the skills I taught them. And you know what? We saw it in Iraq. It worked. The minute uh, after we taught this course in Iraq, the next mass casualty incident, I wasn't having to run around and treat a bunch of petty wounds because these guys were on top of it. They took these skills and ran with it. And my thought was if, if we can teach these Iraqis who may not have the education level a lot of the Americans we're working with do, why can't we teach this to teachers and students and office workers who may may have a need for it? Right, and hopefully they never do, but just in case they ever do one day need it, they have it, and it's a great skill set to have in your back pocket. Exactly, and then the the rest, uh, the team building aspect, you know, we wanted to do something a little different than the normal sort of trust fall sort of stuff that goes on. Walk when you're on hot coals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's stuff that's gimmicky. Uh, we thought good team building, you and I have been through. We've been through team building courses that weren't meant to be team building is you, you just developed as a team going through the spec ops training. Right. And we thought, you know, if we could pare down some of the training events into a civilian friendly format, some of these companies would benefit greatly from the same sort of training environment. So we've kind of taken a bunch of special operations skills and turn them into team building and leadership development events. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, it, like even for me, I really wanted my company to get involved in that because it, it sounds like a, a phenomenal team building exercise. And for somebody coming from the military and now working in the civilian world and understanding the difference in mindsets, uh, I see how much they could take from something like that. But, you know, it's got to be the right company, the right people that, that have enough vision to see that. And unfortunately, my company that I work for now doesn't have much vision, so they can't really see it. Um, but that brings us... <laughs> on to a, another kind of interesting part of your life. Uh, so you moved on from Rogue Consulting. And, well, you're still with them, but the next kind of big milestone that's still pretty recent, you were one of a very small handful of undergrad students who's been published in an actual licensed scientific journal. Uh, can we, you, you mind if we move into that a little bit? Because that's just phenomenally interesting. And I think that's, that's a huge thing a huge thing for you. And uh, I, I want people to kind of understand how that works. Yeah. Uh, when I was attending classes, um, you know, I started out as pre-med and I did a medical internship that I 
I don't want to say I lucked into, but they viewed my medical experience in the special forces uh, in pretty high regard, and I was fortunate there. And so I stepped into a med internship that's usually reserved for second year med students. And I spent a summer in Charlotte, North Carolina, doing medical research and ended up getting uh, co-authorship on several different papers. Um, and then, But at that time, I decided I did not want to go to medical school and be a doctor. Uh, I enjoy the field, but I started getting into the archaeology um, through the anthropology degree that I was getting. And it turns out that these primitive survival skills are a real asset in interpreting paleoarchaeological sites. And one of my professors contacted me, asked me if I'd be willing to co-author a paper with him concerning a subject that is maybe of not real high priority to most people, but it's a concerning a set of shell beads in an African site from 75,000 years ago. And this, you know, coming from anybody with a military, I know special operations, rangers, infantry, uh, Cav Scouts, anybody from that kind of background knows immediately what you're talking about. But can you go and do and explain a little bit uh, for for everybody else that's listening what that means, just just why that is such a significant find coming from our mindset, how somebody like us would look at that and go, holy shit, I know exactly what that is. Well, okay. Uh, let me give a little background uh, to make it a little more understandable. I was sitting in archaeology class, uh, paleoarchaeology, and we were talking about the record of human technology. You know, and so the last million to two million years of our history, you can track through the archaeological record as we make major technology advances, if that makes sense. You know, so a million years ago in that time frame, maybe 800,000, uh, we have evidence that fire was mastered. You know, we could control fire and use it to cook and things of that nature. But there wasn't a lot of change uh, up until about 75,000 years ago. Then a site in South Africa right off the coast in a cave, they found these beads. And they're the first evidence of beads in the archaeological record, uh, at least in any quantity. And the beads are made all from the same sort of sea set sea snail shell they were drilled and then they were placed on a string of some nature and the way we we can tell the drill from the marks on the beads and we can tell that they were placed on a string or a piece of cordage based off the burnishing marks on the inside of the drill holes so somebody put a lot of work into this somebody had a concerted effort and and went i want to make this and went and got a bunch of the, the same exact shells and drill the holes into them without, you know, they couldn't just go down to Home Depot and get a Dremel. They manually drilled holes in all these to make this, to make the, these beads. Exactly. And, you know, sitting in class, the professor says, well, we don't really know what these beads were for or why. Uh, we have a, an assumption we're making that they were ornamental. And that was basically it. And so I suggested... And as you were talking about, any, anybody in the infantry realm would probably recognize uh, the other use for beads is as pace count keepers. Yeah, um, ranger beads. We call them ranger, ranger beads. beads. Yeah. And that's why this is called the paleo ranger bead hypothesis. And the way we use them, and just for the audience, uh, we <clears throat> when we navigate with a map and a compass – we know how many full paces, you know, uh, a full step it takes to go 100 meters with a backpack on. And so if you don't have a GPS, the way to keep your distance, to keep track of your distance, is to count your paces. And so for me, I'm, I think I'm 72 paces with a backpack equals 100 meters. So a 100 meter pace count is 72 paces. So what I would do and what we all did in the uh, special forces selection process, when we were navigating, you would count your paces and every 70 or 72 paces, you'd pull a bead down. And then when you got to 10 beads, you know, you'd gone a full kilometer. And for people that don't 
understand the significance of this. You know, when you're going two or 300 meters from the mall to your car, it does matter. But when you're going through selection or you're in Africa or, you know, anywhere you can imagine and you're going 40, 50 kilometers a night and it's not just a straight line, but go, you know, 10 kilometers, go, you know, switch your, your trajectory to 35 degrees and go another four kilometers. It becomes very important to be pretty accurate with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, life or death in some cases. Uh, but it is of note that the special forces uses the ability to navigate as a selection tool to to determine who has the skill set and mental capability to be a, a Green Beret or to be an operator. And that's the infamous star course. If anybody knows anything about special forces assessment and selection, the star course is one of the biggest weed out points of selection. And uh, that's why, because it's not only physically demanding, but it's mentally demanding. Absolutely. And, you know, so the, the term selection actually is kind of an interesting word the special forces use. Um, only the strong survive. <laughs> it's exactly right, because the, the, direct, the correlation between that and human evolution is pretty direct. And while I proposed or I offered up to my professor, I said, you know, maybe these beads were being used to keep count of things, you know, either objects natural events, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, maybe, uh, you know, how many moons, how many tidal events, how many uh, landmarks you pass on a path of travel, who knows. Now, I wasn't suggesting that these cavemen had uh, pace counts and 100 meter intervals and all that other stuff, but just that they, maybe they were using them in the same way we use them to keep track of our pace counts. And it would be a very practical thing to have in a, uh, you know, 75,000 years ago. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a big important part to look at too. 75,000 years ago. I mean, if you look at how old is the United States of America is a few hundred years old. So we're talking about human beings 75,000 years ago, long before the birth of Christ, long before any of our real history, still way back in that realm where we don't have much of an idea about what was going on. And everybody's concept is just these kind of hairy man apes walking around and clubbing each other with clubs. But this find actually shows that, no, they, they had some kind of con concerted mental ability to at least quantify something. You know, it may not have been zeros and ones and, and complex algebra, but being able to quantify an amount of something really lends a lot of credence to, you know, if you look into people like Graham Hancock, they have this idea that human civilization has been advanced longer than we believe. It, it is. It's leading a lot of credence to that idea. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there is kind of a misconception about uh, maybe our caveman ancestors you know, 75,000 years ago, they would have looked like us. Mm -hmm. they, you, they could have sat across from you on the bus and you wouldn't have thought twice about them. But up until this point in time, we don't see anything indicating what you may call a creativity gene or a creativity component to their thinking. There's no artwork before this. There's no what we might call um, – there's no complex tools or what might be called – reliable tools. So it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, we've got a million years of humanity with very little cultural change. Um, now, paleoarchaeologists will point out a lot of minor cultural changes and technolo technology changes, but all in all, there's just not a huge difference, you know, for a million years. I mean, we, in our society, blue jeans go out of fashion in two years. Right. You know, in, in their society, you had almost a million years of everybody wearing like um, skinny jeans, essentially. <laughs> or some, you know, I mean, it's like... Cavemen wearing skinny jeans and hunting uh, hunting uh, buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, culturally, it's it's it, very homogenous. It's, it's somewhat bizarre. <clears throat> and that's where some might suggest a, a gene that was selected for innovation or creativity. Uh, the people I work with, the professor I work with, thinks that this bead counting ability 
may have selected for the neural networks that lay that lead to counting actual counting and a number concept one two three four five six now what we suggest with these beads is that maybe they were what's called a one-to-one -one counting system so one bead equals one lunar cycle or one moon rise or day and this gives you the ability to know precisely what's happening for as many beads as there were. And in this case, 42 beads have been found so far at this site. Hmm. And so we, we, we've been working you know, off and on on this paper, and we have an evolutionary psychologist working with us to explain the neural anatomy and all the other stuff that goes along with it because, honestly, evolutionary psychology is interesting. Let's – Man, neural anatomy is a bitch. Let's, yeah. let's not lie. That's, well, we that still don't a, understand the brain, and we're trying to figure out our ancestors' brains. And it takes a special sort of uh, person to get into the weeds on neural anatomy and cra what, what they call cranial morphology, the, the shape of your brain and your skull. And I'm not talking phrenology from the 19th century, but uh, you know your frontal lobe shape, your – the shape of the little part of your skull that's uh, in the back of your head, mm -hmm. the occipital lobe, there's this little ledge. You can feel it if you feel the back of your skull, run it down from your head down, and there's like a drop-off, and that's called the occipital bun. These evolutionary psychologists attribute different uh, abilities to the parts of the brain that reside within that structure, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And that's not – my specific field, so I let them just <laughs> do their thing and contribute. And we collaborated on a paper regarding how these beads may have led to the origins of counting in human beings. We presented it at a international archaeology conference in Toronto, Canada, last summer, and that kind of you know led to my career so far in academia as it's taken off. And so what was it? Because I remember you telling me the story there because that, you know, for people that don't know. So you five, six years ago, uh, we were both we were both in the army. We were both special forces kind of, you know, knuckle draggers together. And uh, so now you're getting ready in in a few months, right? You're heading off to go to Oxford because of this paper. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I, I presented at the conference um, since a, a lot of the research on – the beads was my research and the professors were wanting to give me that experience. They let me do the presentation at this conference full of PhDs from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, you name it. And I presented, the paper was very well received. Uh, you know, our question and answer periods, usually five, 10 minutes. It ended up going almost an hour afterwards. And, at the end of the question and answer uh, portion, first off, the uh, grand old woman of paleoarchaeology came up and yelled at me and told me I was wrong. <laughs> was that the Margaret Thatcher of, of archaeology? <laughs> That's a very appropriate way to phrase it. Um, and then this other gentleman came up and he almost assaulted me. He was so offended by what I, what I was suggesting. It's funny how uh, people pick things to get offended by. And I understand like the guy's a PhD and he spent, you know, 30 of his years, 30 years of his life in academic study of a very small, like a particular thing. And you're shattering that. <laughs> I can get it, but it's still, it's funny as an outsider to kind of look at that and go, I hey, really wanted to try and fight a green beret about that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And I, I, I consider myself an outsider in this field, so I'm always viewing everything as an outsider. Well, and I think and, that's probably why, you know, I, I, from my idea, if, if you look at everything in the in the normal paradigm, and that's kind of the way that we are taught is you always look for somebody who's got, oh, well, this guy did his undergrad in this, and then he did an internship for this, and then got his master's and his PhD in this, and now he's been working in the same exact field for 40 years. He must be the biggest expert. But then you can get a dude that's, you know, just out of college to come in and look at a problem this guy can't figure out and go, hey, you guys, you're going from A to B, but you should be going from D to Z because yeah. it's that outside of that box mentality, being able to have uh, uh, at least a moderate amount of intelligence, but to be able to look at a set of problems with a fresh 
set of eyes and, and take yourself outside of the normal paradigm and truly be outside of the box. And I think it goes with anything, with business, uh, with academia, with anything that you look at. You know, that's where these astounding uh, leaps were coming forward in, in physics and ideas are is all these different scientists that have stopped only asking scientists within their field. Now we have things like string theory and super string theory and all these other crazy ideas where there are scientists from different fields that are coming together and they're brainstorming with guys that haven't spent their whole lives in you know, particle physics or Newtonian physics, other guys that have spent their entire lives in number theory or other things that can look at it with a fresh set of eyes and go, oh, dude, clearly this is where you're screwing up. And I, I think that's it's it's interesting because people will. People will be afraid because you're rocking the boat and you're shaking their foundations because you have such a wide base of knowledge and experience that a lot of them don't have, you know, because we have this background with being on the ground in different countries. And fuck, I mean, you did two deployments in the cradle of civilization. You know what I mean? Like, when was the last time one of the other uh, researchers that you work with was where civilization started? <laughs> you know, like, they're not walking around Afghanistan and Iraq lately, but you have been. So that's really cool that you have that kind of background to look at it with a fresh set of eyes. No, it it, it has been invaluable. And it's... it's uh... It's not just the primitive survival skills uh, that give me somewhat of an edge because a lot of these archaeologists have studied some of these primitive survival skills. I think most paleoarchaeologists know flint napping, probably can make an atlatl or you know a bow and arrow sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's a little different from just learning it in a field school and actually living it. Um, like I did through the primitive survival courses I took and teaching it and, um, and really no, really needing it to survive. Right. It's one thing to read it in a book. It's another thing to rely on that knowledge to keep your ass alive. Yeah. And that's another thing because, you know, uh, last year I then attended the advanced, the first ever advanced practical skills application of that survival course, uh, because the seer, school, the survival school, wanted to test these skills in a real life environment. So they picked uh, three of us to be part of this kind of experiment where they dropped us off out in the woods. They took away everything modern to include our pockets on our clothing. We weren't allowed the use of pockets. We had no flint and steel, you know, no fire starters. And then we had to live uh, for like 10 days with nothing, you know, we didn't, they took our shoes on day two. We were allowed. Wasn't the premise that you had like just escaped from, from a POW, you were a POW that had just escaped or something like that. That's that's exactly what it was. And, uh, you know, it was a test as it were. Uh, you know, it was, they picked two guys from the actual seer school. And since I was in the guard, I was the guard survival instructor, uh, I was the third choice because I had picked up the skill set pretty readily and I'm dumb enough to volunteer for something like that. <laughs> uh, so the three of us just sucked. I mean, no <laughs> shoes, em- no metal. Embrace the suck, airborne. <laughs> you don't know how. <laughs> yeah. your, your Nalgene water bottle, man, you can't imagine how much you wish for a container to carry liquid. Oh man! Um, in a primitive, truly primitive survival situation, what a what a fucking advance it is to have a Nalgene bottle or just an, a Coke bottle. A you bottle. Know, you, period. We used to, you know, yeah. People would look. You see other Americans that would go to say Africa. We spent a lot of time in Trans Sahel Africa, and we would always get a trip because more than anything, the Africans wanted our water bottles. You know, Absolutely. Out of anything in the world, those water bottles. And you go, what the, you know, the first week you're there, you go, what the fuck? Why are these guys going so crazy over our shitty plastic water bottles? But then you break down, you realize their main source of subsistence. So take Niger or Nigeria or any of those Mali, any of those areas right there, their main source of subsistence. It's, it's not cot. It's, uh, what's that tuber that they eat? Um, millet. It's millet. And it's like the husk of a certain kind of tuber. And they take it and they put it in their water bottle and they mix it with water throughout the day and they drink the water for breakfast and then they nibble on it for lunch and then they cook it for dinner. It's just this like fiber of this husk. 
And if you don't have a water bottle, you basically don't have a meal throughout the day because there's not much of it to go around and they need some way to carry it around with them because they're not fat Americans sitting in their apartment watching Beavis and Butthead. They're Africans that have to walk 10 miles literally to go get water from a river. You know, yeah, the, so. the value of a container to carry water cannot be overstated in a survival or primitive living situation. Yeah. Once um, you get, I mean, once you get a mile away from a river, man, I mean, you're sucking. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's the key thing is if you don't have the ability to carry liquid, all of your travel and your hunting and everything has to revolve around finding water sources. Yeah, Freak- if you have no maps, if you don't have GPS, if you don't have a Tom Tom strapped to your ass, and you're right. running through the woods with no map, you literally you have no idea when the next time you're going to find water is. You're absolutely right. Um, and so that that course and everything else has really contributed to my interpretation of paleo archaeological sites and data. And it, not only that, but the tactical sense we acquired in the special operations, you and I view the world always will from a tactical perspective. You're always looking for entrances, exits, security positions, threat positions, you name it, you know. I mean, and that's a, that's a mindset a lot of people don't have. It's not their fault because uh, I never had it until I had to have it. It, it was ingrained in me by necessity. Uh, but that sets the tone for you when you walk into an archaeological site. All of a sudden, you're viewing the site from the tactical perspective a caveman would have had to have had. And, yeah, it's that's a different approach. And it's, it's a, it's a I think, a valuable approach. And it's given me a leg up in this field. Yeah, it is. And, because you got to think about primitive man. That's the way they saw the world because it really was. I mean, fight or flight every day, like survival of the fittest. Uh, at any point in time, a saber tooth tiger can come in and eat my ass. <laughs> like, I need yeah. to survive to reproduce. So every time you walk into any situation, how am I going to get out of here? How am I going to defend myself? How am I going to live to procreate? I mean, you know, the, the effect of predatory cats on human evolution also is probably one of those really understated things uh, because predatory cats probably influenced how we evolved quite a bit. And there's still asshole kids that throw rocks at tigers in zoos. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, but at, at that conference, after the woman yelled at me and the guy yelled at me, and my professor, who is uh, the, the psychology professor, came up and he gave me a big hug and he was like, you fucking nailed it. And I was like, what do you mean nailed it? I just had the grand old old woman of archaeology <laughs> tell me I'm an idiot. He's like, do you think she tells everybody they're an idiot? <laughs> she bothered to tell you you're an idiot. You fucking stuck something in her craw and you got her agitated. That means at least you had something worth saying. Most, you know, and it, it was in a sense a really good compliment. I ended up leaving on good terms with both the people that yelled at me. And uh, at the end of that conference, I had a gentleman, um, an archaeologist from Oxford, approach me and ask me what program I was with. And the thing here is the conference that I attended, they screwed up my name tag. So they didn't put my university affiliation on it. Uh So it just had my name. So nobody knew who I was. I screwed up my PowerPoint presentation because I didn't put my affiliation or my status, you know, undergraduate dipshit. Crazy like a fox. (laughs) So none of these people knew who I was. So they all assumed that I was a graduate student or a professional researcher. And, you know, the the gentleman from Oxford came up and asked uh, if I would be interested in a fellowship working with them. And I said, uh, you know, I kind of have to go graduate graduate school first and he said (laughs) what do you mean are you in a master's program i said no i'm an undergrad he said oh okay are you interested in attending a phd program i said yes i I just you know haven't thought about it much now and he said would you like to go to oxford and i said uh why yes i would thank you and (laughs) um 
Who would say no? Like, <laughs> right? And am I supposed to say no? You're, no, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I, that that sounds like a good idea. And so I, he said, you know, I will be reviewing the applicants to my program. I can't pull any strings for you, but um, if you're if everything else is in line with what you presented today, then I think you'll have no problem getting in. Mm-hmm. So I did. And then uh, in, in February, I was accepted to their PhD program in paleoarchaeology or hunter-gatherer archaeology more specifically. And so I start in October. That is awesome. And so yeah. you're going to cool. be doing – you're doing your PhD. You're doing your PhD at Oxford. And they're going to give you some leeway, right? They're going to let you kind of travel a little bit back and forth and kind of let you – I mean, that's how a PhD is, right? It's not all, you know, your undergrad is mostly memorization, taking tests, things like that. But your PhD is a lot more hands-on than, uh, than that would be, right? It is. It's, it's almost all research. And, in fact, they had to um, kind of do a they, – they let me skip the masters, as it were. <laughs> that's uh, so, so just – all right, I, I got to reiterate that because Clint is a, is a little bit too modest to do it himself. Uh, what he just said – is that he's skipping his master's program. He's going, he went from the army to uh, his undergrad in archaeology and was one of the first published undergrad students in archaeology ever and is skipping master's altogether and just going to his PhD, not at the University of Illinois, at Oxford. I mean, that's one of the things that even if you never went to college, even if you don't know anything about higher education, you got to be living under a goddamn rock for the last uh, rest of your life for all of your life to not know what Oxford is. That's, uh, that's amazing. And I couldn't be prouder for you. I mean, that's, that's one of the coolest things in the world. And it's one of those deals. I hope your ears aren't burning every day, man. Cause every damn person I meet, I have to brag about <laughs> my buddy that's that just got accepted to Oxford for his PhD. Cause that is fucking awesome. You make us all look good, brother. Thanks Rob. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, and I really just can't, yeah, I'm, I'm a lucky fucker in this regard. I found a skill that takes, knuckle dragging and literally <laughs> knuckle dragging and <laughs> makes it a an academic field uh, an academic profession you know and that's uh i like doing it it's fun i mean i, I i'm my phd research project is going to involve setting traps primitive trap systems and testing the efficiency of them on specific animals found within the archaeological record so basically what that means in plain speak is I'm going to travel uh, the world for three years setting primitive traps out in the woods and testing how efficient they are at targeting certain animals. And so – and the underlying theme there is you're not, you're not just doing it to have fun, but you're doing it because modern archaeology has an idea about what they think people knew, did, and used in certain areas. And you're actually going and testing those to say – Yes, this is viable. This could work, or no, not a chance. You could you could get enough sustenance to survive, and and adequately uh, a reason for the the brain development or sustenance of physical stature of that time period. Right. That's exactly right. Um, and this is what's called experimental archaeology. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, experimental is kind of my focus. I d- I love going on digs. They're fun. You dig holes for a few hours and then drink wine until 2 a.m. for a summer. It's not that bad. Um, well, but, it's that same concept we talked about earlier. You get dirty. You go play around in the, in the dirt. You, you grow your beard a little bit, and you make your wife a little upset. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, it, it's a way to go get dirty and call it science, man. I love it. <laughs> it's great. And this, this trap-setting research project will be the same sort of thing. I, I will get to do things that I already do. I already enjoy doing and uh you know it, at a point i realized this could be my trajectory and that's kind of why i uh didn't finish the pre-med program i just said you know this sounds way too much fun um <laughs> well uh, you gotta love what you do man you gotta got, love what you do yeah. and i liked medicine i just didn't love it you know and that yeah. was the the kind of crucial point am i am i doing medicine because i like it or because I love it. And this, I love it. You know, part of it is that it takes advantage of skill sets I already have and makes me kind of a unique asset in the field. But um, it, it'll be fun. I'm I'm excited to shit about it. And, you know, it's, 
it may not be saving lives. Um, I've already done that. So I'll move on and do something that's enjoyable and hopefully nobody's shooting at me. <laughs> Yet. Yeah, you never know. That's the thing about archaeology. You end up in some of the places that uh, that might happen while you're there. But you're right. And that's uh, that, that gives me another leg up in the field, yeah. to be quite honest. That I think one that the Oxford uh, Committee considered, when you have to pick when you have graduate students that have to lead expeditions into the field, uh, you, you can choose between a 24 year old that may not know how to change a car tire or a 34 year old, uh, green beret that's led combat operations in the shittiest parts of the planet and then treated people for appendicitis the next day. You know I mean? So when you look at places, you know, when you're talking about archeology span and ancient civilization, you know, when you talk about, Persia, that's Iran. You know, when you're talking about Mesopotamia, that's Iraq. Like when you're talking about the cradle of civilization, if you're really going to challenge the fossil record or to look for the true essence of humanity and where we started in real history, that's in all the war zones of today. That's in North Africa. It's in trans Sahel Africa. It's in Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran and all these places where there's assholes with guns everywhere, man. So <laughs> It's a little ironic almost. Yeah. Um, but you're right. These these parts of the world are a where uh, the most strife is now, and b where all the best archaeology sites are, uh, mm-hmm. paleoarchaeology specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's an interesting correlation, you know. I mean, yeah. Well, and you know, in the end, you're you're doing what you love. Uh, you're good at what you love, and you're probably better suited than any anybody else to do it you know even a guy that may have the academic chops of 30 years uh of a leg up on you doesn't have a, a, a minute of the field experience you have and that thing that's innate in us now to walk into a situation and have that very primal how am i going to survive here mentality where is my nearest water source you know what am i what do i need to do if this happens like what do i do when the when the lions come, like, how, where do I find food? What do I hunt? How do I find shelter? That's the basic essence of survival, shelter, water, food. You know, that's it. And that's in, so deeply ingrained into us that we don't even have to think about it anymore. We don't have to burn calories thinking about it because it's immediate. You step off the plane or you jump out of the chopper or you get out of the Humvee and you're immediately going, how do I survive here? And uh, that gives you a leg up. Well, and actually, when you, your point on uh, burning calories, that's that's kind of the essence of uh, if you have to break it down to its simplest components, is is what you are you know looking at from a caveman's perspective. And maybe they didn't think about it in terms of calories or whatever. But is what you are doing worth the calories you have to expend to do it? Mm-hmm. You know, everything is a calorie game. That's the history of evolution. Is uh, calories and having sex you know so bringing in calories and reproducing so for the calorie game you know if if it's say there's an apple tree five miles away and those apples look tasty but you're going to burn 2,000 calories walking to get them and you're only going to get 300 from eating all the apples you see then it's not worth doing so that that's a huge component in evaluating archaeological sites paleoarchaeological sites well and that's the great thing about nature is she's unforgiving so you got probably a dozen you know corpses of dumbasses on their way back from that apple tree you know the skeleton with an apple in their hand while you got uh you know the smart guy that stayed there and, and learned how to make a fish hook or uh or yes. do whatever it was that they did you know that's exactly right rob and that that's kind of the crux of the matter and um you know, maybe for a future podcast, this this could be a really great discussion about how humanity evolved, um, dealing with those sorts of choices and what we do see in the archaeological record, and what that implies for us as modern humans. What you know, what what did these evolutionary selection events do to us? Why do we behave the way we do? Why do we act the way we do? Why did some of us have big asses and some of us have <laughs> small little tight asses? And some of us like big asses. I like Asian girls love, with big asses. That's the rest of my so way, man. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> Why do I love girls with big asses? Yeah, you know? it's just a, na- and it is, it's, it's funny because you can break it down and look at exactly who does it, you know? 
you're right. Yeah. Uh, and th- there's some very interesting correlations between maybe your, um, what do you call it? Your, wh- where you came from yeah. genetically, evolutionarily, what part of the world and what your sort of behavior traits you carry with you. Mm-hmm. And everybody it, likes to think I'm the, I'm the lone snowflake. I'm different. But when you break it down, if you, if you go binary, if you go in zeros and ones, or if you go into basic raw data, you're not a snowflake. I mean, it, there's no, a little... <laughs> and you know, now you're getting into the, uh, what's called sociobiology, the nature nurture argument. Um, and you know, uh, evolutionary biologists tend to not really get involved in that argument. It's more sociologists that have a bigger stake in this, the nature nurture thing, but you, you've got eminent, amazing people like Edward O. Wilson, who, if you ever watch Nova, he's on a number of Nova specials. Oh yeah, I watch uh, it religiously. He's a, he's an entomologist from Harvard, and he, he studies ants, these social insects, and how they evolve, looking for traits that are behavioral traits that are evolved. And the guy's a genius, but he's also somewhat of a pariah in the community because he views everything from an evolutionary behavioral lens. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if, if you can go to pbs.org, look up some of their old Nova episode, look up Master of the Ants. It's an amazing tour of his uh, career and how he approaches evolution. Well, and that's a, you know, it's a scary thing to, to ponder if you want to look deeply into that at the whole idea of evolution and survival of the fittest. Or it wasn't survival of the fittest, it was survival of the most adaptable. But you look at today... You know, whereas, you know, not in very ancient history, not very long ago, you had to really know how to expend the fewest calories and, and, and harvest the, the largest amount of, of food and calories for you and your offspring and your family to survive and ward off attackers and do all this. And today you can drop out of high school, go on welfare, have 10 kids, all be fed by the government eat McDonald's three times a day, get fat, you know, 300 pounds. The government pays for your hospital for all of your medical bills. Like, what is that saying about our evolution? Because it really is. That's part of humanity is learning how to get the biggest gain with expending the fewest calories. It really is. Some of us have a deep, like, insight and, and like, will and, and just work ethic and drive that even if there's not a great payoff, we want to do the best we can. But a lot of people don't. And that's kind of what society is getting. That's their reward complex. They're learning you don't have to do much anymore, that you can really do nothing. And now the government will subsidize everything and take care of you. And so this whole evolutionary trait that we've had for thousands of years, as long as humanity has been around, is being subjugated and destroyed now because we're going from you need to learn how to save calories to survive and do this and and do this and do that to do nothing you know, the government will take care of you. And it's, I know it's a, it's a completely another subject and that's a whole nother can of worms that we can talk about for hours and hours and hours. But that scares the shit out of me. We need to look at it at a biological level about what is happening to us, not only societally, but biologically when those reward complexes are being completely changed. Uh, and there's no more work required for reward. Uh, it's a very scary concept. And, yeah, I don't know. I mean, how long do you think a caveman would have survived if, uh, you know, the saber-toothed tigers were out there, but they also just had a place that people came by and brought them meat, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> I, I don't know, man. It's it's scary how much we're, we're trying so hard to change ourselves so rapidly without knowing what's going to come of it. Um, so, yeah. But, you know, you, you, you brought it up earlier. And there are, I mean, just from you and I talking, there are at least a dozen more things that, that I want to have you on to talk about. Uh, the Toba volcano is a big one. Evolution is another big one. I'm very interested in these ideas that uh, humanity is older than we think it is, or at least technology is older than we think it is, or that whole Atlantean idea that there was a greater civilized, technologically advanced society, and then they lost everything, and, and we started again. And maybe that's where this Toba volcano idea... Uh, may, we I think you and I should have a long talk about that one, too, because... I think we would share a lot of uh, correlations in there. Um, but I think we're just about out of time for this one. 
But I definitely want to have you back as many times as you will come back because, again, there's, I mean, Pandora's box. There's, there's at least a dozen other things that I can think of off the top of my head that I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, and I, I, I know, at least from the people that have been listening to the previous episodes, that a lot of people will be interested in hearing uh, this kind of stuff more. So I can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, I couldn't be prouder of and happier for you for all the stuff that's going on in your life. One of the greatest people I know in the world. Happy as hell for you. I, I feel better knowing that everything's working for you. And I'm glad because couldn't be happening to a better person. Uh, again, Rogue Consulting, uh, you can check out. I'll put the links on farfromcenter.com. You can also go through lovemewhenimgone.com to the friends links. It's Rogue's Consulting Group website and Facebook. I'll have them all up there. Clint Janulis, uh, thanks again, brother. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for uh, thanks for talking with me. Thanks for you know sharing some knowledge with our audience. And uh, I can't wait to have you back, brother. Thanks, Rob. Good chat, man. Yeah, you too. And uh, everybody out there, I hope you're listening. I hope you learned something. And uh, I hope uh, it makes you want to go out and crack a book and, uh, and learn a little bit more about us, evolution, uh, human history, and, uh, and what's going on. Because a lot of stuff that you know, Clint talks about, you don't, you don't read in your normal history books. So it's, uh, it's good information to know about kind of where we came from. So uh, thanks again, Clint. Thanks to everybody for listening. And uh, now we're going to take it out to our next segment. Okay, so that was great. I love talking with Clint. Uh, again, Clint has agreed to come on a few more times. We're going to have him on to talk about the various things that he's studying in archaeology, his reality show, and uh, just some other stuff. So uh, have a listen and uh, keep on the lookout for future episodes with Clint Janulis. Now, before we end up the uh, the program today, I'd like to talk a little bit about USA Cares. Sometimes I read a letter written to USA Cares by a family they've helped. Sometimes I do a case study, and sometimes I just talk a little bit about them. Uh, but today I have a case study, so I'd like to tell you how USA Cares helps people. This is uh, an example of, a, of an individual that, that they helped and, and, and what they do to help people. So again, I've said it before, but it's one of the very few veterans charities out there that actually gives the majority of your money that you donate to helping veterans. You know, a lot of these other organizations spend more on administration and advertising, basically paying themselves and talking about themselves than they do helping people. But USA Cares gives a very large majority of the money that you donate to them right onto the veterans that they're helping. So here's an example of one that they did help. They were recently contacted by a discharged veteran who was medically discharged in January 2013. So this is very recent. Uh, the veteran is unable to do most normal functions, such as getting out of bed and putting on shoes. He also has P PTSD. His spouse takes care of him full time and is applied to the VA family caregiver program. But again, she can't have a job because she's taking care of him full time. The VA has benefits for things like that, but it's a very long process. I just read a thing saying that the VA is a million uh, people behind. They're, they're behind. They have a backlog of one million claims. So that means this was January 2013. Uh, they're probably not going to get help anytime soon from the VA. So the soldier is still pending a rating from the VA, although he does, does have a proposed rating of 80%. That means the VA has said, we're probably going to give you an 80% benefit rating. But again, they've got a million claim backlog, so it'll take a little while. He's applied for Social Security, and they're waiting for medical records. Again, the military is going to take a very long time to get those to him. His congressman is now helping him move the VA approval process along. USA Cares provided an assistance grant of $350 for food and fuel. So again, that's one of the big things that USA Cares does. Um, they're an immediate stopgap. Uh, the VA is going to help this guy out, but it's going to take them a very long time. USA Cares is there right now. Uh, they get back to soldiers within 48 hours uh, of their request, and they do a lot of great things. You know, I've heard stories of them calling tow truck drivers while they had uh, cars up on the truck to repossess and, you know, throwing down the USA cares credit card number and saving those, those cars. They've saved soldiers and veterans from getting their house foreclosed on. They keep lights on, they keep the food on the table. They do a lot of great things. So please support them. Go to usacares.org, follow them on Twitter at usacares.org, and do everything you can to help them help our vets and soldiers in need. 
Okay, so thanks again for tuning in. This has been the Far From Center podcast. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate all you're doing to support the show. And I appreciate you guys uh, telling your friends because, you know, again, I've been following the downloads. So this is awesome. We've been growing exponentially and uh, hopefully it keeps going. So uh, now, as I do at the end of every podcast, I'd like to ask if you have a drink in your hand, if you would raise it and join me in saying, Berg Heil, De Oppresso Liber, and most importantly, God bless America. Said you don't need money, you don't need fame, don't need people to know your name.